we're going to do some exciting things herpetologically speaking. We're uh, going to build five new ponds on MPG and uh, we're also involved in a, a big turtle distribution study and um, I'm going to focus on the outlying areas because one of the things that's important to realize about amphibian and reptile species is they, they, do a, they have a major migration from the spring period, the breeding period for most of them, to uh, summer foraging grounds and a lot of those places are actually off MPG uh, but contiguous to it and one of the uh, one of the more interesting animals that's I think here um, is actually also of course incredibly common the common garter snake um, but uh, I, I wanted to focus on it specifically because Western Montana is the only place in the nation where we have variability with with this species uh, usually garter snakes when you find them in a specific area they have one one particular set of characteristics um, and here we do have we found some variability and I want to explore that with you today. So this is a picture of a, uh, one of the snakes that was in uh, the, the southern circle of the uh, clubhouse pond. Um, and there was maybe, there were 58 little toadlets left and on the water's edge when I found this snake. So the snake was enjoying the bounty of toadlets. Um, here are, these are um, data points for where I've caught snakes this past summer in 2012. The blue dots are racers, the green dots are terrestrial garters, and the red dots are common garters. So as you can see, the racers are um, at, at basically most elevations on the ranch. Uh, the terrestrial garters you tend to see, uh, at least I'm finding them more in the wetlands, although they're, they're distributed all over the place too. And then the common garters, of course, are only found in the wetlands. I was surprised to find a common garter up uh, up that far in Davis Creek, but uh, it was located there. This is, this is that, uh, the perfect pond that Jeff described across from the ranch, and this is where we know there's um, Columbia spotted frog breeding, toad breeding, and bullfrog breeding going on at that particular location. One of the things I wanted to do is describe, just so you'd, uh, just a little bit of education here, um, the difference, um, anatomically speaking, between the common garter and the terrestrial garter, of course, we've got the color differences, but that's not necessarily the, the best way to, to tell the, the difference because there are common garter subspecies in Oregon that have, uh, that, that look almost like our terrestrial garters, the grays and browns and these kinds of things. The way you tell is you count the number of labial scales, right, starting with number one there. There's eight labial scales on the, um, the terrestrial garter and seven on the, the common garter. Another, another distinction is that the terrestrial garter has, has a broader um, scales in the, uh, on, the, on, its, on its forehead, essentially. The, the snake, and the, they, we think that this is because uh, they have a wider range of food that they will eat. When they get incredibly large, they'll, uh, they tend to feed on rodents, on medium-sized rodents. So the, the common garter doesn't have as a great um, diversity of species that it consumes. So that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons why that may, might be the case. Uh, the, you can see that the, this common garter here that was actually in the picture before, uh, that's got some red flecks at the nose, flecks behind the cheek. And so some, and I've talked to three different herpetologists about this, there's a lot of debate of, of whether this is a separate subspecies or one that's called the Fitchy, which I'll describe in a, in a moment. So uh, why are common garters so successful? They're the most successful reptile in uh, North America. Uh, you can find them from Panama, pretty much all the way to Manitoba. So uh, they're, they're all across our, our continent. And there's several reasons why they're so successful. Um, they've got a lot of plasticity in the sense that you can find them in, in hot swamps to, um, to, to cold almost alpine environments where there's, some, where there's running water. They reproduce uh, relatively well. Um, they, uh, they're, they're actually commonly used for, for lab experiments because of their ability to, to reproduce and the ability to, to, to find them. They also feed on a wide range of, of, of wetland animals, um, from insects to, uh, to uh, fish, to but especially amphibians and worms. Um, and, and they also tend to, once they start feeding at a young age on a particular 
animal, they'll tend to, to stick with that animal in terms of preference. Of course, you notice their pattern, like the long-toed salamander, they have a, a yellow line on their back, which mimics the grass that they're moving through. It makes them hard to, uh, to, to essentially pin down for predators. And one of the, one of the real special things about um, garter snakes, and this is the, in the subgroup of natrocenes, um, which includes other water snakes as well, they actually have the ability to uh, raise their own body temperature by up to nine degrees. So, you know, this, this would make an incredible difference for a snake, if you can imagine. Uh, we found terrestrial garters sitting in Davis Creek with a water temperature of 55 degrees. So they're just sitting there waiting for a little, a little fish to swim by, right? Just, just hunting. Or that the snake is caught out in an October snowstorm. And this snake will be able to get to an area of protection where another snake would not be able to do so. So both the terrestrial garter and the common garter have that ability, and that has enabled them to be the great generalists that have moved into this region after, um, after the last ice age. This is, a, but despite the fact that common garters are common, right, there, there, are, there are some concerns regarding them. Um, the, the, we know in, in ideal conditions, only 16.4% survive to the second year of life. And rarely do the animals that we encounter live in ideal conditions um, anymore, right? Uh, one big problem, of course, are bullfrogs. Uh, Jeff gigged one this summer that uh, had a, a garter snake in its belly. It's very common for, for bullfrogs. They'll just eat anything, of course, small garter snakes included that come on by. So uh, that's a problem. But even more so, than, more so than that, the fact that bullfrogs carry chytrid is a huge issue, um, and they're not affected by chytrid. Uh, the, the, the fungus, um, unfortunately, feeds on keratin, so it feeds on the, the skin, the skin of adult frogs, and that's the real problem. So it's wiping out the adults. In Panama, they've had an 85% uh, decline in, in amphibian populations. So it's just wiped out amphibians in Central America. Um, it's, it's wiped out the, uh, the, uh, the leopard frog in the, bit, in the bitterroot drainage. So, of course, when the food's gone, then this is going to affect the snakes as well. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a huge problem. Um, and unfortunately, I think bullfrogs are, are here to stay. Uh, also, cattle grazing is an issue. Predatory fish that, that aren't native to the waters can, of course, take out a young garter snake that's skimming the water looking for something to eat. Uh, we've got issues with habitat fragmentation. We've got narrow river valleys here. That, that could be an issue. Uh, right now, the uh, National Park Service is noting there's a decline in the population of common garters at Yellowstone. They're only in one drainage at Yellowstone National Park at this point in time. And they used to be commonly seen. So there's a question in terms of why is that occurring? And they don't know. Um, so they're, they're, uh, the USGS is, is, is monitoring uh, Yellowstone more now in terms of frog populations to see if that's, that's what the uh, issue is, if there's a loss of, of a food source for them. Um, well, it, one of the interesting things, of course, about where we live is that, of course, the, the divide is close by, and we know that, for example, the, the Sai, which is our subspecies of um, gopher snake, is only located east of the divide except for this one spot. And we also know that racers have gotten across the divide. We actually have the eastern racers here, not the western racers. So if that's the case, then it probably makes sense that the periotalus got here um, and is, it is within this, this region. Um, and there's, there's some debate about this in, in the literature. Uh, I, I spoke to Bryce on Monday. He said, well, yeah, this is what I thought back in 2003, but I'm not really sure anymore because uh, I think he, he was re referencing another um, herpetologists who thought that peritalis is located here, uh, but Bryce is, Bryce is adamant that we need to do further study in terms of genetic characteristics of, this, of the subspecies to find out what we have. Uh, so the one that, that is throughout California, throughout the Great Basin region, that is positively identified as the Fitchie. Uh, the Fitchie has, as you can see, a, a, a very bright dorsal stripe, bright yellow dorsal stripe, uh, it's paler, it's paler yellow stripe along the sides. Uh, you, you, you'll see smaller red 
dots along the body. The top of the head is black, and that's kind of that's a key key uh, point. And then, and this is what's kind of interesting. You've got there's no black spots on the edge of the ventral scales. The ventral scales are, of course, the scales across the, the belly of the snake. And if you look here, there's actually, it looks like there's a little black here, which is kind of, so why would that be the case, I guess? Um, the, what's interesting about the clubhouse is the clubhouse is garters, and these are four garters caught um, in various areas of the clubhouse floodplain. They're, they're remarkably similar. There are some, some variations here. You can see that the snake the bottom left here, uh, it doesn't have the really, well, the really bright line on top, right? Um, and, it, it, uh, and then this snake here doesn't have the, the, the really red pattern on the cheek. Um, but other than that, they're, they're quite similar. But you can see that they still, they're, they're very distinct, distinct beings, actually. Right? Uh, the, 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 the club and this, and I apologize, of course, in the sense that this is an old, this is an old uh, map, and it will take in a while before, the, of course, the clubhouse pond was built, so you can't exactly see the dynamics here. But uh, the this common guard, this 24-inch, was caught. That was the first picture I showed you, right above where the toadlets were in the in the southern end of the pond. The uh, the common garters. Ten, where I tend to find them, and this is a real herpetological hot spot at the ranch, if I had layered uh, where the turtles are and where I catch a lot of toads and frogs and these kinds of things, this area is just is huge. There's always activity going on here. And it's activity that goes on at different times of the, of the season. So in June, I'll find common garters here. In September, there'll be terrestrial garters here. The common garters will sort of disappear once the water goes, and you just don't find them anymore. Um, so. So all, all these, these common garters that are here that tend to show these fitchy char characteristics, I, I think primarily because there was, this area was so inundated with bullfrogs, and because it's actually, the wetland here is close to the, uh, the river, that we have a lot of, uh, there's less diversity than what we'll see at the northern floodplain, where you have bodies of water that are at a greater distance from the river, essentially. And you have, I also see more species diversity in terms of other, other animals I'm seeing there as well. So, um, so th this, this recent work by, by St. John said that the common garter is variable. Many individuals appear to be typical of the fitchy. Others have a solid black ground color between stripes with no red in the pattern. And this is reminiscent of snakes that are, we find in, in Manitoba. Because up, up in, uh, there's, there's some red here, but there's, there's, there's comparatively speaking, there's, there's very little red on this snake. Um, in Manitoba, where they have, they really have to get, they only have two or three months when they can be out of the snow, basically, right? Or they're hibernating the rest of the year. So they, they need that thermal capacity, which a uh, black, black background provides, right? Okay. And, and a little bit more about the variability, and this is kind of interesting. This, this uh, specimen up here, um, you can see the seventh labial scale is actually slit. And that's, the, uh, that's, that's something that you just, it's pretty rare. Usually, usually I'll have a seven distinct scales. And then here, uh, th this one, see how little, um, little red is available there. Uh, the other, this is Davis Creek, and I, I wrote a, a report on the, um, on the, on this particular spot. There's a, where these two draws come together, right here is where the, where the pool is, where the, the cutthroat trout live. Um, and what I found was that there was a, there's a herpetological hotspot up here where there's several snakes and toads that were around a group of pools where the baby, um, or the, the, the young minnows, Trout minnows were swimming upstream and trying to establish in these pools, and the snakes would just hang out and feed on these minnows. And I found this common garter further up from that, which I also found surprising because I would think they would be, you know, feeding in the same areas. And why would this common garter be all the way up here when I'm not finding uh, sufficient um, amphibians to really keep it going? And maybe this common garter adapted to the uh, to eating the fish like the terrestrial garters had. Uh, what's interesting about this specimen, it's, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful snake, um, is here we've got 
in terms of color distinctions, we got that, that lighter band, the lighter bands of color, um, a darker red, darker red around the head, and almost a cranberry and olive col colored head. So that would lead you to think that it's not a Fitchy, because Fitchies only have the black head. And then um, the, uh, and this is just so, that's a parietal. They actually have a third eye, snakes do, and lizards do as well, which enables them to, uh, to, to basically, it's a temperature gauge, essentially. Um, we, uh, and then here's the, the northern floodplain. Now, there's, the northern floodplain has a, there's a lot of interesting things going on here in the sense that we've got a lot of diversity of, of, of color, a diversity of, 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 um, of species. Here, the, this spot is where the, the main toad um, breeding area or nurse, nursery was. 5,000 uh, tadpoles were in that pool at the end of the season. Um, the, so I see a, a lot of activity right around uh, Toad Pond is right here. Just in here, here is where I see most of the, the garter snakes. When I was, I was actually uh, saw Columbia spotted frogs up here uh, and I was going, trying to catch one and then I just, it stepped on the edge of uh, the, the pond and a melanistic garter, which is a, sh a solid black garter, went right over my foot. And that's something that, you know, it's like one in 10,000 in terms of a genetic variant. And then in this pool um, right here where I, I caught that terrestrial, I also saw something that I was completely unexplained, which was a, a gray stripe, looked like a terrestrial garter with red bands. And apparently there is some hybridization that occurs. Um, so it's possible that I saw that hybrid. I just, I wasn't close enough to really kind of even put the point on the map. So. It's something I, I'd like to look for. The problem for me, of course, is when, when I'd like to be hunting these snakes and trying to find them and trying to get more data on them is when the, the, uh, the elks are calving. So that's, a, that's an issue. Um, the northern floodplain, I had one that looks pretty similar to the Fitchy, but you can see it's got these, it's got these uh, red, it's got these black, some black bands on the ventrals. It does have a black, black head. And you can see this one, and this is the only time I really, I have difficulty, I can't, there's no way to catch one of these when it's on the water. They can, they can swim very quickly. I don't want to disturb the environment. They're in there, all the tadpoles below them. And they can just, I've seen snakes at 96 degrees outside. They're just swimming like lightning on the top of the water. And then if I go to try to, to catch one, it'll just grab onto a piece of grass and shoot down under the water and be gone. Right. So uh, they're, uh, they can be, they can be evasive. And then this snake, when I, sh when I showed this snake to Bryce, he just, I just heard this huge gasp from him because he'd never seen a snake like this before. It's, it's, it was literally green, glowing green, um, in terms of the ventrals and in terms of the side stripe. Uh, also, the coloration here is, is, is magnificent. The, the red here, there's red, and, and see the orange here, too. Um, it's a l very large specimen. Uh, caught close to where that racer, racer picture was earlier. So is this what the red-sided garter? It has, uh, it has greenish uh, stripes on it. Um, there is some reddish and orange tinges on the side. Uh, there's, there's reddish and orange bars that are there. The head is an olive, but more almost a cranberry color. But the key here, which is really makes it distinct, not only the green, but look at the dark dark uh, lines right above the ventral scales. So that's something that you just, you, you won't see. I won't see that on the northern floodplain, or, or the clubhouse floodplain at all. So this leads, I don't think a snake that is this brightly colored would survive with, with bullfrogs, basically. It would just have been, it would have been nailed. Whereas here in the, in the northern floodplain, there's lots of spaces for them to go. Uh, it's, it's a diverse environment, although we did have a couple major gigging events in, uh, the uh, nor northern floodplain, comparatively speaking, there's not that many bullfrogs there. So I think that that leads to species diversity, which we don't have in the clubhouse floodplain. So what I really, and, uh, what I really need to, to do is to, to get some more, um, to, to be able to catch some more, to get some more variety. And I found out that there, there actually is one, there is one uh, place in, and Washington, where they're, where they're doing genetic testing of garter snakes, and the reason for this is kind of shows the idiocy of, of human beings. Apparently, uh, at the University of Washington, it's popular to, uh, as a, as a, for, for those rushing, 
for fraternities to, to, to make the young freshmen uh, lick a salamander. And they, they actually have very toxic, a couple of very toxic salamander species that can literally kill you if you eat them. So because of human stupidity, they decided, well, maybe we need to study the common garter, which is able to consume highly poisonous uh, salamanders and, and frogs. So uh, that, that's the whole reason that there's a genetic study going on of, of common garters right now. So uh, I've got to be sending scales to this lab over the next uh, few months. All right. Any questions for the 